All right, so the chances are, if you're a guitar player, you've bought a guitar before that you really like the look of, but perhaps it doesn't quite play the way you want it to play. Or perhaps you've bought an old guitar somewhere online, perhaps eBay or Facebook Marketplace, and you need to sort of restore it to its former glory, or you're just someone who likes to mess around with guitars and learn how they work. This video is gonna help you out if you've never done that before. We're gonna talk about the importance of setting up a guitar. Now in this video, I am gonna be using a very old guitar which I'm gonna be restoring for my cousin. This is an old Honor Baron. Now I don't know much about this guitar, but I do believe it dates back to the 80s. I think this is probably like a late 80s guitar. Based on the serial number, I'd probably put it at around 1987, but really I don't know a lot about this, but it does need a bit of TLC. So it's very dusty. The strings are flapping around. The action is super high. The vintage style trim is sticking up. This guitar needs a bit of sort of assistance to get back to a good playing level. So in this video, I'm gonna give you some tips and tricks you can use to either set up your first guitar, or if you're buying a guitar, like I said, and you need to restore it, basically this guide is gonna help you do that. These tips are designed so that you don't have to be a professional luthier or a guitar pro to follow them. Anyone out there can do this for the first time and get their guitars playing that little bit better. So obviously if there are any steps in this video you're uncomfortable doing yourself, please take the guitar to your local luthier because we are gonna be doing some things like adjusting the truss rod, some of these things you may not want to do if you're brand new to playing, but there are going to be some tips in here that will appeal to anyone out there who just wants to give their guitar that extra 5%. Before you get started on your setup, you need just a few simple things. So the first thing is a set of strings. I'm going to be using these Ernie Ball 10 gauge regular slinkies. I'm also going to be using this Ernie Ball Musician's Toolkit that my friends at Ernie Ball very kindly sent me a little while back. This is pretty much a simple toolkit that has everything I need. So it's got some string cutters, a microfiber cloth, a screwdriver, a ruler for measuring height and action, a couple of different wipes for cleaning the guitar, a string winder, and the Allen keys that we need. I'm also gonna be using some of these Ernie Ball Wonder Wipes. This is the combo pack, which has fretboard conditioner, instrument polish, and string cleaner. You'll also want some tape. This will become apparent why in a little while. Some quadruple O-grade steel wool. This is a very fine substance that I'm going to be using for cleaning the frets. That's why we're going to need the tape. And the other thing I'm using is these little fret protectors. These are just these little metal inserts that you can just slot over your frets to protect the board from the steel wool. So the first thing we need to do, step number one, is get these old strings off. So this is gonna be part of the cleaning process. We always like to clean the guitar before we start. So these strings are pretty loose. They've been on here a while anyway. So I'm just gonna go right ahead and get my string cutters and just cut them at the 12th fret. That is just gonna ping the strings off like so. And now I can just pull those out of the guitar. Sometimes it's quite useful to take the back panel off as well. So actually on this guitar, I'm gonna do just that. The back panel on this guitar is held on with six screws. I'm just gonna take these off. This will just allow me to access the trim block easier, which actually is something else I need to be doing in a moment, is I'm gonna be tightening this trim block down so that it no longer floats on the guitar. All right, strings off. Now, I did actually notice the trem block on this guitar is actually cracked a little bit because it's quite an old guitar. So actually it's a good thing that I'm gonna be bolting this down today. So I'm actually gonna do that first of all before I actually clean the guitar. So the advantage to doing this to the trem block is that the trem is not gonna float and move. If you've got a vintage trem, obviously it will move up and down with the string tension. This could do with a couple of extra springs in, but I don't actually have any extra springs at the moment. So we're just gonna screw this right down and see if that will hold it in place. Okay, so the trim block has been screwed all the way back. Now that should add a little more stability to this, especially given that the block is actually cracked. So now this guitar has a lot of dust on it. So I'm gonna start cleaning this up. So the first thing I'm gonna do is use a couple of different cloths just to take the initial layer of dust off this thing because this thing has been sat unused for quite some time. So it has accumulated quite a lot of dust. This thing could definitely benefit from a good cleanup. 
The fretboard is exceptionally grubby as well and the headstock almost looks gray because there's so much dust on it so this is definitely going to be much happier once it's cleaned okay so now that the first layer of dust is off i'm going to start cleaning the guitar with these ernie ball wipes so the combo pack has a couple of different types of wipe in there there are two different types that i need for this so i don't need the string cleaner because we're putting new strings on but what i do need is the instrument polish and the fretboard conditioner. I'm gonna start with the instrument polish because I'm gonna be doing some additional work to the fretboard very shortly. So I just wanna start getting this guitar cleaned up. So I can always go back and add another layer of polish later on if I need to. This is just to get things started. So these wipes are preconditioned. You just go over the body with them and they should lift off anything we don't want on there. So this guitar, hasn't been cleaned in a very long time so I suspect I'm probably gonna have to give this another once over when I'm done with the setup process just to make sure we've got everything because this is definitely pretty grimy and it's definitely seen better days. We want to make sure the headstock is clean as well and we'll flip it over and just run over the back. So that is a bit cleaner. We'll just go over that now with the microfiber cloth just to pick up anything we missed. So obviously if you guys are doing this to your own guitars and the guitars you play, they're probably not going to be as grubby as this thing is. So now what we actually want to do is I want to tape up the frets. So this is step number two. I'm going to clean the frets. So these frets are, they're in pretty good condition. They're actually, you know, pretty high. There's quite a lot of life left in them but they could benefit from a clean. So the reason I have this electrical tape is to cover my pickups. So the reason for that is I'm gonna be using steel wool to clean the frets. And steel wool is made from steel, which is magnetic. Now the reason for the tape is that when you use steel wool, it basically turns into loads of fine little steel particles, which you don't wanna get stuck to your pickup magnets. If you get steel wool stuck to the pickup magnets, it is a nightmare to remove. It is possible to remove, but it's a real pain. So just be safe, put some electrical tape over your pickups. It doesn't affect the guitar at all. And it just adds, you know, 30 seconds onto the cleaning time. But it's worth it to not have to remove thousands and thousands of tiny little steel fragments from your guitar pickups. So the steel wool, looks like this. You basically tear a little bit off. Now you only need a little bit at a time and you need these fret protectors. These are super cheap. You can get them on eBay, Amazon, anywhere you want. They don't cost much money, but they're a worthwhile investment. You may see some people who will tape up the fretboard to do this, but these just make it easier because you can literally put them on each fret. So the way you would do this is you place it like that over the fret. Now you can see this covers the guard either side, just exposes the fret in the middle. Take the steel wall. Now you can see if you look very closely on the camera that this fret has like a slightly green hue. I think I can probably zoom in so you can see that. It may not show up as clear as I want on camera, but this fret is quite grubby. So I'm gonna go over this now with a steel wall. And steel wall is just lightly abrasive. That's just gonna take off any rubbish from the top of the fret. So this fret is actually now already, I can see how much shinier it is. And you don't want to be too heavy with this. You just want to go back and forth nicely just to take any excess off the top. I drop my fret protector there. Just back and forth until you can see the shine of the fret. What steel wool won't do is it won't obviously bring out any dents in your frets. If you have dents or chips out of the frets, you're going to need to use a fret file. I would probably suggest taking that to a luthier at that point. So this process, you would just repeat for each fret until each fret is as clean as you want it to be. You don't need to spend too much time on each fret. The steel wool does lift everything off pretty quickly. All right, frets are now cleaned with steel wool. Now we need our fretboard conditioner wipe. So this guitar may require a few coats of this. I would usually give a dry fretboard two or three coats depending on how dry the board is. So what this is gonna do is this is gonna recondition the wood. So on a rosewood style neck like this, you really want the wood to be in good condition because over time, rosewood will dry out, it will shrink, and it'll cause your frets to fall out. 
So what this does is this adds the moisture back in. So you can see as I'm rubbing this on, the guitar neck is getting darker. This is just gonna penetrate the wood. So just to get this on there, don't be afraid of you know getting it everywhere. This is designed to get into the wood and really recondition it. So the board already looks healthier even just with one coat. So my first thing I would do is I would leave that settle for a couple of moments just because you know it needs time just to penetrate the top layer. This guitar fretboard has a lot of dirt and oil and all sorts of lovely things coated on the top of it from years of use. So just gonna get that on there and leave that for a moment. And then we'll come back to that in a few moments and see where we stand. So now that it's settled in, the wood looks much healthier. It's got a nice dark shine to it. It's in much better condition. And that's actually only after one coat. This could probably do with a couple more coats, but for the purpose of the video length, I'm just gonna move on with the setup now and maybe I'll apply another coat later on at some point if I need to restring this again before I return it to my cousin. So now we're just gonna take the tape off because I'm done with the steel wall. I no longer need that on there. And there's actually some particles of steel wall on the tape, which isn't auto-focusing currently, but it is on there. So obviously that's the stuff we don't wanna be getting on our pickups, because that stuff is a nightmare to get off. So once you're done with the tape, you can simply dispose of that. Don't get that anywhere near any other pickups because again, it will come off. Step four is to tighten everything up. So I always like to do this at this point before I start applying tension to the guitar again in the form of strings. So the first thing I'll do is I'll always check the trem cavity. Now obviously you saw me tighten that down earlier, so that's fine. But I will check the neck, make sure the four bolts for the neck are tight. So there's one there that's loose. When you're tightening anything on a guitar, don't force it. Tighten it to the point where it naturally stops, where the resistance is sort of at its peak. Then maybe just give it a tiny, tiny little nudge, but you don't want to obviously be over tightening things. I would usually check the strap buttons, but this guitar doesn't actually have any fitted. Uh, and I don't actually have any spare strap buttons to fit onto this today. Because I'm locking the bridge down, I'm just going to tighten these six pivot screws here as well just to make sure that bridge isn't going anywhere. Now, step five, the new strings are going on. So let's get these Ernie Ball strings on the guitar. So I'm gonna start with the low E, because that's the first one I've taken out. So if you've never restrung a guitar before, obviously the method is slightly different depending on what guitar you're playing. This guitar, even though it's a SG-ish kind of shape, it's got a Fender style vintage tremolo bridge. So we need to load the strings to the back of the guitar. So flip the guitar over and the strings need to go through these holes here on the trem block. Now you need to remember when the guitar is in this orientation that it's backwards. So this block here, or this hole here, is the low E string because now that's the furthest one away from us. So we're pushing the string through this hole and it's going to come out on the top of the guitar. So you bring it out of the top like so. On the bridge, we have these six saddles. So the saddles are what hold the string in place. So we want the low E string to come over the first saddle, coming up then to the headstock end. The string will sit in the nut here. Then the tuning peg, now this bit's quite important because this is gonna aid your tuning stability. So a good method for thick strings is to wrap them like that once round and a half and take the end of the string thread it through the post and pull tight now in the tuning process this will add an extra wind here so we'll be like two and a half or three winds around this post that will just make sure that there's a good contact point here at the tuning peg and again at the bridge which means you get extra tuning stability so we'll just give that a quick turn just to add a little bit of tension to the string and then we'll start by adding the rest of the strings on. On a guitar with a three-a-side headstock like this, you have to remember when you get to the G, you're going to be working the opposite direction. So put the string through the back of the guitar, pull it out over the top. But this time when we get to the headstock end, we're going this way. A 
Another thing that is important that I didn't mention is as you're winding the string around, so once you've done your three rotations on your unwound strings, I would recommend, so one, two, three, always make sure each winding is above the previous one. Then when you're pushing the string through the post, make sure that is above the windings. So this part of the string here that goes across is above all three windings, which are stacked above each other. This is gonna give us a really neat winding around the tuning peg as we tune it up. Also, the tuning goes the other way on this end of the headstock, so the string is gonna be going outwards from the center. So if your tuning pegs have the strings coming on the outside edge and they're tuning in, that's wrong. It should always be inside out. This is because you keep the straightest line possible from the nut to the tuner all the way down to the bridge, which again, aids the tuning stability. Step number six, tune and stretch your strings properly. So this is a very important part. So I'm just gonna get these tuned up now. Just got my tuner off to the side there, which is the main tuner on my Line 6 Helix. So obviously I'm setting this up for standard tuning, which is E, A, D, G, B, E. If you are gonna be putting your guitar in different tunings or changing the gauge, it's always a good idea to change your setup for each tuning just by repeating these principles. But obviously I'm just going for standard here because I don't need to actually do any other tuning on this guitar. Okay, so that's sort of in tune now, but not quite, because the next stage is very, very important. So once you've got your strings tuned pretty much to the pitch you want them to be tuned to, then you need to stretch the strings. Now what the stretching process does is it makes sure that the connection at the tuning peg and at the bridge is super tight. It pulls out any loose ends or any kinks in the string. What this then means is you get a much more stable string. So if you've ever restrung a guitar before and you've just tuned it up and then wondered why it's dropping tune very quickly, that's why. So to stretch your strings, it's very, very simple. There's a couple of different methods for this, but here's the method I use. So the first thing I will do is I'll tune the string. So I will play my low E string and make sure that on my tuner, that references an E, which this one currently doesn't. But that's because I think the input jack on this is a bit dodgy. So there's some more work we need to do there. So let's just get that to E on the tuner. So that's now in tune. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna grab the string around about the 12th fret here, and I'm just gonna pull it. So I'm gonna lift it up, pull it away from the guitar, and when I release that and check the note again, it's gonna be flat. So that's actually now down to a D. So I'm gonna tune that up to E once more, stretch it again. I will move the stretch along the length of the string. So I'm just grabbing the string, pulling it upwards. I'm not putting too much pressure on and pulling it up till it naturally stops and then just going a little bit further. I'll just do that along the whole length of the guitar right up to the nut. Check the string again. That's now only half a step out. So I'll put that back up to E, stretch it once more and check it again. Now it's only slightly flat. So now we'll nudge that back up to E, do that once more. The aim of stretching the string is so now that's perfect. So when I stretch the string, it stays in tune. You wanna keep doing that now for all six strings. So this only takes a couple of extra minutes on top of your usual restring time, but it's worth every second of it. So all you do is just tune it up to the pitch you want, pull it up along the length of the string, check the tuning, retune, and keep repeating that until the string stays in tune. So I'm gonna do that now, and then we'll come right back. Okay, once I'm happy that the strings have been suitably stretched, I can now go ahead and trim off the excess string at the top. Now, I haven't done a perfect job yet because I'm gonna go back and redo some of these parts at the end as well as part of my final once over that I always do on a guitar. So I'm just gonna snip off all the excess string because no one wants any excess string floating around to poke them in the finger as they're tuning. So let's just get all of that off there. So now we're gonna move on to step number seven, which is a step that a lot of people don't really wanna do when they first start their own setups. This is checking the truss rod. So the truss rod, for anyone who doesn't know, is inside the neck of the electric guitar, there is a steel rod. So this steel rod runs directly up inside the neck. You can't actually see it. On some Fender style guitars, you may have a stripe on the back, which is a cavity to put the rod into. On this type of guitar, 
the end of the rod is hidden under this plate here. You may see other guitars where it's hidden at the base of the neck as well. So the truss rod's job is to counteract the tension of the strings. So obviously when we put strings on and we tune them, they're pulling the neck upwards. Now the truss rod's job is to counteract that to keep the neck straight. So if we have a truss rod with not enough tension in, the neck is going to bow forward like this because the tension of the strings is going to pull them because the strings pull towards the bridge and towards the headstock. So it's going to create this tension which pulls the neck up. And if your truss rod has too much tension, it's going to go the other way. The truss rod is going to be pulling the neck back so hard that we're going to get a back bow. So the middle of the fretboard will be higher than the edges of the fretboard. So you don't want this concave and you don't want this bow. You want a nice in-between. So some people like a really straight neck. I like a slight concave in my own setups just because of the way I set guitars up. But again, this is all down to you. If you want your action super low, you might want to go for a much flatter fretboard. This also works better on very modern guitars where you can get a super low action. So on this guitar, we need to first of all check it. So to measure the height of your truss rod, I always use a feeler gauge. You can do this manually as well, but I just find the gauge speeds it up for me. So the measurement that I always take and this is quite similar to what a lot of manufacturers will recommend, is 0.25 millimeters or 0.010 of an inch. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a capo and I'm gonna put the capo on the first fret. Now the next thing I wanna do is I wanna push down the last fret of the guitar. I wanna insert my feeler gauge underneath the eighth fret. So with a capo on one, and my finger on the 22nd fret, I'm going to take my gauge and slide it under the string. So as a general rule, if the gauge won't go under the string, that means there's too much tension in the, in the truss rod, which means the neck has got a back bow. If this goes under the string and there's a ton of room, there's too much of a concave in the neck. So this actually happens to be perfect, which is interesting because I wasn't expecting it to be perfect. And I can check the base side as well. And that is actually the same. So the truss rod on this doesn't actually need adjusting, which is interesting because I could have uh, I could have been convinced that it would have needed it. So if you do need to adjust the truss rod, you would remove the plate of the headstock, you would use a large Allen key or the correct tool for your guitar, and you would tighten or loosen it to compensate for the neck bow. So if the neck is bowing forward, so you've got that concave, that means there's not enough tension, so you tighten the truss rod to pull it back. If the truss rod is back bowing, you would loosen it to allow the string tension to even it out. Now, truss rod adjustment is something a lot of players don't want to do, so if you don't want to do that yourself, take that to your local luthier and get them to do it for you. Step number eight is the action of the guitar. So the action is the height of the string from the fretboard. This is the distance you have to press down to get contact with the frets. So you can use a measurement tool for this, like a ruler, or you can do it by eye or by feel. I personally set up all my guitars with the same action just because I know the way that feels. So my method is to take the guitar, take my ruler and measure. I always measure at the 17th fret and I look for a two millimeter action. So the action in this is currently on about three mil. So I would be looking to bring that down by about a millimeter. So on a guitar like this, we've got this Fender style bridge with the individual Allen key heads at the bridge to adjust. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go into my Ernie Ball toolkit, look for the right Allen key, which I suspect is probably gonna be the smallest one because it usually is for these type of bridges. And it's not, so it's actually gonna be the next one up. Okay, so that one fits. So what I need to do now is because the string is too high, I need to loosen these Allen key bolts. So by loosening these bolts, it drops down the height of the bridge saddle. Now in doing this, you're gonna be losing string tension, so you will need to check your tuning as you go along as well. Now I always do this by two millimeter, as I said, so I'm just gonna eyeball this down to two mil, and then I will tune the string up again. So that is currently just above two mil, so a tiny bit more. And that action is now perfect. 
So now I'm going to check that string's tuning, which as suspected has dropped. So I'm just going to put that back up to E. And now I'm going to do this for each of the remaining strings. So I'm going to check my B string at the 17th fret, which I can see is actually sat at four millimeters, which is quite a bit. So that one needs to come down quite some way. So again, same principle, get the Allen key in, loosen the post and the bridge saddles will lower. Keep checking your work as you go, make sure you've got the height right. Again, you can always feel this out as well. Some people know how they want their action based on feel. I always use this measurement because I know it just works for my own playing style. Action is very subjective, so don't let anyone tell you there's a set action you need to set your guitar to. It's whatever you feel comfortable with. That's the most important thing here. The action can be as low or as high as you want it, as long as you feel comfortable and you enjoy the way it feels. Action lowered, now we can go on to step number nine, which is the intonation of the guitar. So the intonation is again, very, very important. This is the tuning of the string for the length of the string. So when we check our open string tuning just by playing the open string and seeing what that reads on the tuner, that can read in tune. But the length of the string, which is determined by the distance between the nut, this point of contact right here, and this point of contact here on the bridge saddle, can differ, which means you can get differing pitches along the string. So for instance, just because the open string is in tune, doesn't mean the ninth fret is gonna be in tune. So the way you check the intonation is by adjusting these saddles back and forth. This is different on a Gibson style guitar, same with the action. If you're adjusting the action on a Gibson style bridge, it's the entire bridge that comes up and down. We have more control on these fender style bridges. So to adjust the intonation, we're gonna use these screws here on the bottom of the bridge. These ones you can see on the underside. These control the forward and backward movement of each of the saddles. So to check your intonation, play your open string, check your tuner. So I can see this E is slightly flat because I've been adjusting it. So I wanna adjust that now till the E is in tune. The next thing I wanna do now is play the 12th fret. So I'm just gonna fret that with my index finger Pick the string again, now I can see on my tuner that is sharp. So what I need to do now to compensate for that is I need to adjust the intonation. So when it comes to adjusting the intonation, all you need is a screwdriver. Like I said, I've checked that 12th fret note. I can also check it with the 12th fret harmonic. I can see that one's also slightly out. So my E note is in tune, but my 12th fret note is slightly sharp. So what I need to do here is I actually need to lengthen the bridge. So if the 12th fret note reads sharp, you need to make the string slightly longer by tightening the saddle to move it backwards. And if the intonation reads with the 12th fret note being flat, you need to shorten the string by loosening it, which brings the saddle forwards. So like I said, for this E, I need to tighten the string in order to get more length on the string. So what you might wanna do is you might wanna just nudge the tuning peg down slightly because by doing this, we are gonna be adding more tension to the string, which does increase the pitch. So don't be afraid to just nudge the tuner as you're going as well, because you don't want to break a string. So let's get that E back in tune. Check the 12th fret again. That's actually a lot closer. Now I just need to do a slight bit more. And now the E is in tune. So what this means is once I've done this for every string, my string will be in tune as an open string but also having the 12th fret note in tune also means that the notes along the length of the string are in tune. There's no perfect way to do intonation. It's always just close enough. You can never get a perfect intonation on a guitar, but you can get it as good as you can get it. So as long as the 12th fret is reading in tune, the same as the open string, you're pretty much there. This also means when you play chords all over the neck, those chords will also be in tune with each other. So again, like with everything on the guitar, just repeat that step for each string. So the A string is also slightly sharp. So I wanna add some length to that string just by tightening it, which in turn is gonna sharpen the string. Drop the string back to A, check the intonation again, and that is now in. So I'm just gonna repeat that now for all six strings. Step number 10 is to check the pickup height and make sure all the connections, the electrical connections are solid. So the pickup height is the distance between the pickup and the string. Now again, there are no standard measurements for this. You can pretty much do whatever you want. A lot of the time, if you buy some different sort of measuring tools, you will see some 
what they recommend as standard uh, sort of measurements on the back. But the way I always look at this is I always measure from the last fret, which is depressed, check that against the height of the pickup. Now, anywhere between one and a half and two mil is pretty good, I think. As a general rule, the closer you get the pickup to the string, the more output and the more attack it's gonna have, and the further away, the softer and warmer it's gonna be. You do have to balance pickups, so especially if you're playing like a Strat, for instance, with three pickups, if you have the middle pickup really low, if you engage the middle pickup or one of the positions that uses the middle pickup, you're gonna notice a volume drop because the pickup height is unbalanced. So I tend to set my humbuckers pretty close to the strings just because I like that vintage bite. So I'm just gonna tighten these two, uh, these two screws here either side of the pickup. This pickup is actually a little different, I just realized, where we actually have two screws on the base side and one on the treble side. It's quite unusual. Usually a humbucker will just have one screw either side but I'm just gonna bring those as close as I can to the string and then measure it again. So I'm just gonna do the bridge pickup at the same time and then measure and fine tune. This is just gonna give me a brighter, more clear and balanced sound. So now let's check those measurements again. Those humbuckers look a lot healthier now in comparison to the string. So my neck humbucker now is actually slightly too close. So I'm gonna bring that one down a little bit. And the good thing with guitar setups is you can take your time with them. You don't have to rush them. Make sure the guitar is the way you want it. So take your time. That is about two mil now. So I'm quite happy with that. And the same on the bass side. This humbucker casing is actually slightly unbalanced. Uh, one of the coils is sticking up slightly. So again, I'm just doing a best guess here. The bridge pickup is also slightly too high. So let's just take that down a fraction. And I would say that is perfect. Now, one other thing I always do at this stage, if I can find it, is I always like to throw some of this on, which is a contact cleaner. So I will always take the pots off, which is quite tricky on this guitar because they're kind of wedged on, they're good. So I'm just gonna pry those off with a screwdriver. And there's a lot of dust under here as well, actually. So what this is gonna do is this is just gonna help clean out the electricals of the guitar. So there we go. So you can see that there's actually a ring of dust around these. So I'm gonna use this stuff, which is contact cleaner. This is a lubricant for electrical components. It's not wax based, so don't use anything like WD-40 on the guitar. Just get that on there and allow that to just permeate into the electrical components. So obviously, there's a bit of dust there, so give those a little twist just to make sure you work it into the contacts. If you ever hear your pots crackling as you play guitar, it's probably because there's some dust or some sort of debris in there, especially with older guitars. Same with the switches. This guitar could actually use a new switch as well because the original switch tip is no longer there, but I don't have a spare one to fit at the moment, so I will just leave it as it is. It seems to work anyway, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem. Let's just get that clean. Underneath here has probably never been cleaned in the 30 plus years this guitar has existed. So there's a lot of grime under there. Most of which is pretty hard baked onto the guitar. So I think this is gonna need a few coats of <laughs> guitar polish and electrical lubricant to free everything up. Okay, so now let's get the pots back on, or the pot caps, I should say. So let's just get those on. Make sure they're all facing the right direction. And there we go. Okay, I'm also gonna put a bit of this into the jack socket as well. When I do this, I always get my jack cable and just get that in there, just to make sure it's all worked in as well. So now that should all be good to go. So we should have all the contacts lubricated and everything should work. So really the final stage of the setup now, which is step number 11, is just for me to test this and repeat anything that needs to be repeated. So I'm just gonna quickly check on the tuning again, make sure that is all in place. At this stage, I would often recommend also checking 
the intonation once more, stretch the strings once more, basically just give everything one final going over. Make sure everything is staying in place and everything is staying where you want it to stay. So that still needs a little bit of a tune up. So let's give that another quick stretch. You will find that things move when you do setups on your guitar. So obviously the more you move things around and the more you shift things, the more likely things are to shift in the overall setup. So don't worry if you do have to repeat a few steps, that's quite normal. And even big well-known luthiers will tell you the same thing, that sometimes the setup needs to be done a few times just to get it to stick. Obviously older guitars like this have some more temperamental parts in, so you may find if you're doing this on a budget guitar or a vintage guitar that's had a bit of a hard life, the setup might take a little longer to stick, but I'm pretty happy with that now. That seems to be holding tune pretty well. I always like to check a few higher notes just to make sure we've got no dead notes. Ring a few chords out and I think we're good to go. So that is my 11 step guide to setting up a guitar. So just in summary, step number one, clean the guitar, strip it down, take all the old strings off, give it a wipe, get all the dust and grime off. Step number two, clean the frets, use fret protectors, they will protect your board. Some fine, fine, fine 4-0 steel wool. It's not super abrasive, but it's enough to clean the frets. Step number three, condition the fretboard. Look after your fretboard because if it dries out too much, you don't want your frets to come loose and fall out. So make sure you keep that wood hydrated. Step number four, go over and just tighten everything up. Make sure the neck pocket screws, the bridge screws, the jack socket screws, the tuner screws, everything is tight and holding place. Step number five, restring. Put some new strings on there, get those ready to tune. Step number six is tune those strings up and then stretch them. So make sure you put the windings very neatly on the headstock end and stretch those strings so they hold tune. Step number seven, check the truss rod. Check you have the right amount of relief. You don't want too much of a concave or any back bow. Get that neck as straight as you want it. Like I said, I like a slight concave just for the way I set guitars up. Step number eight is the action. Measure the action. I always measure it at the 17th, but you can also measure it at the 12th. Set the action by a visual measurement like I do or by feel, the action is the height of the string. Obviously the higher the action, the harder the string is to push down. Step number nine is to intonate the guitar. You do this by adjusting the saddles at the bridge, forward and back to make sure the string is in tune across its entire length. Step number 10 is your pickup height. Make sure the pickups are as close to the strings as you want them to be. The closer to the strings they are, the brighter and more attack the sound will have. This is again, personal preference. So listen as you do it as well. Don't rely on standard measurements. Just listen to how the guitar sounds in your rig. At this point, I always like to check the electrical components and use any switch cleaner if I need to as well to make sure everything is nice and clean and just there's no you know, debris in any of the contacts. Step number 11, which is the final step, is to test it, retune it, restretch it and repeat until the setup holds and everything is rock solid. So there you go, there is my 11 step guide to setting up a guitar. So I've taken this Honor Baron from the 80s, cleaned it up, given it some new strings, given it a new lease of life. So I'm just gonna play a couple of chords now just to hear how this thing sounds. I'm gonna be going through my Line 6 Helix because that's what I'm already plugged into. So yeah, there we go. Let me know down below in the comments what your favorite guitar setup tips and tricks are. What do you guys do to your favorite guitars or your new guitars or your vintage guitars or whatever guitars to make them play perfectly? These tips are designed, like I said, for anyone to get stuck into. So whether you've done this before or not, you should be able to set up your guitars by following this simple guide. But if there's anything in here that you're not fully confident in doing, don't be afraid to take it to your local luthier, especially things like the truss rod or the frets. These are things that a lot of new players and new guitar tinkerers don't want to mess with too much. So I hope you found this guide useful. I hope there's some tips and tricks in there that help you get that extra 10% out of your favorite guitars. Let me know down below in the comments how you got on with that. I'm just going to play a couple of chords and some licks on this thing now and see how it sounds. If you enjoyed this video and if you've got some good tips from this video, let me know down below. And also don't forget to hit the subscribe button and the like button as well. And I'll see you guys very, very soon. Thanks for watching and enjoy setting up your guitars. Oh, no.